So when I was asked to do this, I was thinking about what would be a good topic. And what I've decided to do is take a few things that I have been speaking about to other audiences, evangelizing to other audiences, uh, to bring here and present to you uh, in hopes that it has some inspiration value uh, to you in some of your own research as you go along. And to start off, I think perhaps this particular uh, image may be familiar to most of you who uh, look at the comics from the Peanuts comic strip, Charles Schultz. Uh, trust is important because without, uh, without trust, you may not be able to proceed, but if you place your trust in the wrong place, uh, you can end up getting hurt. And uh, that we certainly know. The key here, though, is that uh, the trust is in someone or something else. And that led me to just look at some dictionary definitions. Um, and trust here is belief. It is uh, not proof. Proof is something else. Trust is a belief-oriented uh, issue. Commit something to the safekeeping of or place reliance on luck, fate, or something else over which one has little control. And that encompasses so much of what we do in security in general, uh, that we have to depend upon some luck on some matter of fate, uh, if we believe in that, but very little over which we have direct control. Uh, part of this is a terminology issue, and it's an interesting one, because here we talk about trust. In other areas, we talk about cybersecurity or information security. Uh, I generally use the term information security to encompass a bit more, because it's not only the computing systems, but the policies, the practice of protecting the information. Uh, in its design, its creation, transmission, storage, transformation, use, and disposal, it is a full range of activities that we have to secure, not simply the processor or the processing that goes on. What? Oh. I'm going to have to turn off the network from the looks of it here. OK, so that's. Uh, uh, all of those technologies around the handling of the information. Uh, there's also assurance. We use that as a term in some areas. And that's the science and practice of increasing our confidence or our trust in the systems, is how do we know that we can go about putting our faith in those systems. Uh, we have to use both together. And privacy should be a component. All right, so if we define security that way, then uh, we can proceed. Well, not quite, because we have to have terms for uh, security that we can somehow measure or break down and look at characteristics. The traditional way that has been used for some time uh, are these three terms, the confidentiality, availability, integrity. And it turns out, if you actually go back far enough, you will find these were never formally designed. These were never, this was never the output of an academic exercise or a workshop or anything else. These appeared in a talk to managers at IBM by Bob Courtney back in about 1961. And they were adopted thereafter by others trying to describe security. Why is that important? Well, uh, as I'll mention in a moment, how do you measure any of these? How can you do science when you can't measure the properties that we, uh, we hope to have in systems? How do you show that a system has 10% more confidentiality than another? It is, in some sense, a meaningless term. Others have tried to redefine the field. Uh, Don Parker uh, came up with this hexad, this six terms. And if you're not familiar with this, this was introduced in 
I think it was 1999 in the National Computing Security Conference and then in his book on computer crime, and he added control over data resources, authenticity of data, and the utility of data as other characteristics. But even there, these fail as metrics because how do you measure authenticity? How is something 90% authentic? Or how is something uh, six units of utility? So we have a real problem here in that the very fundamental ideas on which we base our designs and our work have really no measurable components. And so that's the first thing I, I'd observe to you is that there are some things that we can measure, but, it is limit, but they are limited in, in application. So we can calculate, for instance, key space size or uh, affected, effective time to brute force an attack, but it's very difficult to go too much beyond that. We do have some information theory that can be applied for reconstruction uh, of information, but again, it's limited. So one of the big problems in communication is simply describing what is security and what is trust. And when we look at all of those properties and we say, well, what's fundamental? And unfortunately, the answer is all of them. If you have any one of those that you fail to uphold, uh, you can't really place any trust in the resulting system. What I am going to contend in this, in this talk is that if we're going to start somewhere, then maybe we should start small. And in that sense, composable trusted components, we know that. Uh, but what does that mean? And I believe that that means we have to look for simplicity, fewer things to measure, fewer things to go wrong. Specificity, we have to build things for specific tasks and limited interactions with others. And I mentioned Bob Courtney, and, and that name, I don't know, how many of you have ever heard of Bob Courtney? Anybody here? One person. Uh, it's, it's in some senses not surprising, but he was in some senses the first security practitioner. Uh, he was the first person at IBM who had the title of security officer back at the end of the 1950s, into the 60s. Uh, and he didn't write a lot. He was not a scientist. He was uh, more of a business person and a, a security manager. He had three laws that I think should make it into the literature uh, because they do capture a certain uh, amount of profound insight. Uh, the first being nothing useful can be said about the security of a mechanism except in the context of a specific application and environment. You can build something that you believe is secure, but if you move it to a different environment <clears throat> or run different data through it than what you intended, that may all fail. And we see that on an ongoing basis on the things we have on the internet. We fail to take into account that security is a local property, not a global one. That we can't really build something that is immune to all threats under all conditions. So uh, this is one of the first really important principles. Second is one we don't understand very often from, an, from a management point of view and is a problem of communication with management. Never spend more mitigating a risk than tolerating it will cost you that in many environments it is well worth the loss to go ahead and expose certain things because you can make more in the long run or it will cost you more to prevent it than it will simply to tolerate it and recover from it. We do that in other ways. So for instance, taking backups of systems rather than buying uninterruptible power, we tolerate the risk because it's cheaper. We need to do more of that. We need to critically examine in those environments where we're going to deploy issues to understand uh, how valuable is it and what are the alternatives. Protection alone is not the goal. Overall trust in the operation of the system is. So if you can recover and continue, you've achieved the goal. That's a, that, so I think that's another key insight uh, from these three that I'd like to leave with you. And uh, third, there are management solutions to technical problems, but no technical solutions to management problems. If you've dealt with people, you understand this. 
you can build in all kinds of controls, but people will find ways around them or turn them off. The technology by itself is not enough. You have to understand people. You have to understand the context the people are operating in. And most of all, you can't get in the way of their jobs because they will find a way around you. People are like water. Uh, they, they will find a way. So uh, these perspective issues here suggest that more than understanding the technology is important if you're really going to have a solution. Now, I've been observing, in general, what's been going on in the security community for quite some time. I've been working in this field for about 30 years. And um, this quote has come up several times over the last few years. Uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I have seen this widely attributed to Albert Einstein, but to give credit, uh, it appears that it actually was written by John Dryden, the English playwright. Uh, quite some time ago, back in the 1600s. So this behavior is not a recent phenomenon, although computing probably didn't go back that far. Uh, there are a number of different kinds of insanity that we see in the research and practice of cybersecurity, information security. Um, I didn't try to capture them all. I just put a few down here that I thought uh, were particularly interesting. So. You know, slightly daft are the people who say, I don't really have a security problem because there's nothing on my machine that's important. And we all know how wrong that is, but unfortunately that's common behavior. Uh, people who are crazy who believe that firewalls are enough to keep them safe or antivirus. So uh, they have a magic talisman that is going to prevent anything bad from happening. And uh, very often that's the antivirus or firewall. Uh, we have people who are uh, really fully insane and they usually go by the title of uh, EDP auditor, uh, and they're the ones who want you to change the password without fail uh, every week or every month, and you have to follow the rules exactly. No matter what you're doing, uh, the rules are more important. Uh, and then there are those, and I had to do this, Cynthia, I apologize, but <laughs> uh, that people who, uh, people who, are, who are saying, well, I'll pay whatever it takes, but I want to have multi-level security on my Windows machine. Uh, and that's sort of, uh, well, I don't care what it costs, but I want anti-gravity for my car. Uh, it's <laughs> not going to happen. Uh, there are a couple metaphors for current software practice that I think embody this insane behavior. And I'm told that the one on the left was actually an Oxford wiring closet, although I don't know uh, if that was the case. It, it may be a little difficult to see there. This is a, a classic picture on the internet. Uh, a whole bunch of wires all running back and forth with a big sign saying, do not touch these wires. And if you look carefully, you can see that there's a trouble light hanging from a bundle of wires. And I was told at one meeting by someone who claimed to be aware of the story that if the weight of the light was taken off the cables, one of the networks stopped working. And so, <laughs> so the light there is an integral part of the network. Uh, if you've ever worked in hardware, you know one of the rules of hardware that's learned is uh, there's no such thing as a, a temporary wire. That was kind of lost there. The, the tool on the right may be a little hard to recognize, but it's one of those multi-use pocket knives uh, that has, I believe this one has 239 tools in it. And uh, this is a metaphor for operating systems and web browsers and a lot of other software we use, they do everything. They don't do anything well, but they do everything. And there's a, a consequence for the kind of design that's used on these tools now. Uh, and I found, I don't know which of these is better. The one on the left is another classic quote that has sort of been misplaced uh, over time. Uh, that it goes back to 1985 which is a program that has not been specified, cannot be incorrect. It can only be surprising. We don't have security bugs, faults, errors. We have surprises because those systems were never designed in the first place. They accreted. Uh, and for those of you who don't have English as a first language, that means it's sort of like gravity and windblown stuff that just came together and caused whatever it was. Um, 
really, that's what a lot of these systems are. They were never really designed. And as a result, they've never been really tested. They were never really planned to be secure. The cartoon on the right, I, I just, I love that because that sort of gets across. It. And for the caption, for those of you who can't see it, it was, it was just going to be a laser printer before we started adding features. Again, that's a metaphor for design currently for most systems. They may start off small with a very clear purpose, but we don't redesign things. We just add on and add on. Um, I have a uh, sort of a, a culturally relevant um, example that I, I wouldn't mean a lot uh, to some of you unless you've been to the Western United States, but there's a, uh, there's a mansion uh, that was put together by the widow of a, a firearms maker. Um, it was Winchester. Remington. Not, Winchester. It was Winchester? It was Winchester. I thought it was Winchester. Um, and uh, her husband died, left her alone in this big mansion that she had all this money. And she went to a fortune teller and the fortune teller told her that as long as the house was never finished, she'd, she'd continue to live. So the house was always under renovation. They were always adding things. And if you visit the house, there are stairwells that go nowhere. There are doors that out open out over empty space. There are windows that face brick walls. And you can just wander around in this house for hours uh, trying to find where these things go. There's no, there's no design. She just, whenever one part was done or she had a little money, she'd hire somebody else to add in a new stairwell or add in a, a new window so that the house was never finished. She did die, so it didn't work. But um, it's, it's an absolutely amazing uh, building. I don't, I don't know if there's anything like it in, in Europe. Uh, if, if you're aware of one, I'd love to go visit. Um, when we look at this problem overall, there are many different vantage points we can take. And I have three here that are perhaps relevant to our community. There's the science question about where we ask what can be done and what can be done efficiently. That's what science answers. What is possible? And to some extent, what is recreatable? Engineering answers what's the best we can do with given constraints. Constraints on time or money or material strength or personnel or, or other issues. That's what engineering is all about, is coming up with solutions with those constraints in mind. Technology is the application of existing solutions to new problems. Now, you may not completely agree with these definitions. Uh, these are working definitions. But the point I want to make here is that as a community, we have somewhat lost our way. We have lost our way in the sense that most of what we do is engineering research and very little science. Because what we have been trying to do is to make existing systems trustworthy. We have been trying to secure existing systems rather than going to the fundamental questions of what does security mean? How do we measure it? What is possible? And those are still things we don't know the answer to, but we are trying to fix existing systems rather than those. In part, that's where all the money is. The companies and the governments have huge problems in the current installed base, and so they continue to throw money at the problem, and that attracts all kinds of researchers. Well, if they're all there, perhaps we should look elsewhere. Uh, I don't believe it's possible to have a technical presentation of any meaning without quoting at least uh, Dilbert. Uh, and I also find that Mark Twain has good comments on these things. Uh, in particular, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. And I would put this to you as something to think about that when everyone is saying that this is where we want to go or this is what we want to do or even this is the question to answer, you should ask yourself, well, is that really the question? Are we asking the right thing? With that in mind, for the next few minutes here, if you haven't noticed, computing's changed a bit in 50 years. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not entirely being facetious. Part of it is we are immersed in computing. I don't think there are too many people here who've, who've been in the field uh, for even as long as 25 years certainly a minority of us here in this room. Uh, but the pace of change is incredible. And we are so immersed in it, we sometimes don't step back and notice. This is the canonical chart of the number of transistors per uh, CPU chip, per bit of silicon, that 
uh, adheres to Moore's law. This is the graph that Moore had extended outwards from Intel looking at the number of transistors on, proce on uh, processor chips. But let me take a different kind of metric. In 1958, using current dollars, and I apologize, these are US dollars. I could have done them in pounds or euros, and I probably should have, but please excuse me for that, that uh, uh, lack. Uh, but in 1958, using current dollars, transistors were $60 a piece per transistor, okay, 50, 51 years ago. The first all transistorized computer, I'll mention in a moment, was in 1958, it was the IBM 9000 uh, series. And to buy one cost you about $21 million in current money, one computer. In 2007, when I last went through uh, the calculations on this, and I could recreate them here, but transistors now about uh, one five hundred thousandth of a dollar each. That's a huge drop in cost over 50 years. Very little else that you will find uh, in the marketplace that is a commodity has dropped so much in price. Let's look at another number. 10 quintillion. That's a pretty big number. Not as big as federal deficit, but it's, a, it's big. 10 to the 18th. Now, to give you a physical sense, and uh, Ed Lazowski at the University of Washington, Seattle, gave me this analogy. In 2004, there were approximately 10 quintillion grains of rice harvested worldwide. Everywhere in China, India, Pakistan, Japan, the US, Brazil, all the countries that grow rice commercially or for subsistent farmers, every grain of rice altogether, approximately 10 quintillion. Why 2004? Because 2004 was the first year we manufactured more transistors than we did grains of rice. And it has increased every, rain, uh, every year since then. That is a truly astonishing quantity. Every year since then, worldwide, more transistors manufactured. Every year an increasing amount. So that's more than just processing power and density and cost. Disk storage, let's look at that. 1958, about 2,000 bits per cubic inch at about 10 cents in current dollars per byte. The picture in the lower right, for those of you who've never seen one, uh, is uh, a drum memory with a cover removed. And these were really fascinating beasts if you ever had a chance to work with these. Um, basically something like a big uh, industrial drum, oil drum, that was mounted on a um, uh, synchronized uh, motor with an axis and it would turn and there were fixed heads that would go along the surface of the drum. They didn't move, they were just fixed over tracks and the whole drum was coated with a ferrite material and that was your storage medium. And, and these things were really, really uh, uh, fascinating. Well, what happened here? Did I, I went. Okay, we'll try this, go back to this slide. Um, there's a ghost in the machine. Um, so so the, uh, that was the old style memory. And now we're down to the point where we have flash drives where you're, you're getting um, giga, gigabytes worth of flash drive in very small amounts. We've all got small flash drives that we carry around. They're given away free at places. So the density has gone up to uh, 425 gigabits per cubic inch for commercial memory. And about 10, that same 10 cents now buys 100 megabits instead of per byte. Again, huge change. Look at the price drop, look at the density increase. To give you another example, that computer sold for $21 million in 1958 that required its own air conditioning plant and a staff and a whole building to house it, had less memory and less processing power than a greeting card you can buy at a shop down in town that will record your birthday greeting and play it back to music when you open it up. I don't know what the cost of those are here locally. It's probably three pounds, thereabouts. More powerful and more memory than a $21 million computer 50 years ago. 
So let me ask you this question. Why are we still using software constructs and models that were designed for $21 million room size computers? Why are we still mired in the past? And I would say part of this is a bad feedback loop. The software has gotten as complex as the hardware supports. And so as a result, the hardware vendors have added more features to the hardware as well as making it faster to support reasonably those extensions that we add in the software. But as soon as that happens, we find yet new things to add on to the software to make it more complex and slower. And so we're caught in a cycle and it's very difficult to get out of it. And in part that cycle is driven by this backwards compati compatibility mindset. Let me give you just a couple examples uh, to, to get you thinking along these uh, somewhat different lines. Uh, the von Neumann architecture, for instance, was a breakthrough. And again, I think 1958 was about the time um, this really became a major issue. I mean, that was a little earlier, 1956. So what's on the left, for those of you who've never seen one, is a plug board. That is a computer program. Prior to the von Neumann architecture, if you wanted to write a program for a computer, you would take a series of perforated boards and you would plug wires in from point to point to uh, uh, show the path of the gated logic, the signals, as the compute program operated on. And you would put a, a group of these plug boards in, uh, a system, one after another, and the program would execute by establishing the signal paths. Very tedious. Um, I may not look that old, but I have programmed that way. And it, it is, debugging is difficult. When you get a wire that breaks internally, it's, it's messy. Uh, but John von Neumann's insight here was, well, why don't we have the computer fetch what's in memory as data and treat it as instructions so we can actually have the program as data? And that transformed the way we looked at computer programs. Hello. It's not moving forward here. See, here's part of the problem, right? There we go. So one of the problems with the von Neumann architecture is it treats contents of memory as executable program. So when you overflow the stack with other data, you can jump into that data and treat it as executable. Uh, so core faults, when programs overwrite part of memory uh, and you then execute that overwritten data is another example of where problems occur <clears throat> from um, being able to execute memory. So what I would ask you is, are there things that we can do differently if we segregate memory differently? And more than simply saying that memory is not executable, that's been around for a long time. We can set pages as non-executable. But are there other things we can do? Keep in mind, transistors are free effectively. Memory is almost free. Those are not really design constraints, particularly not when we're talking about science, when we're saying what is possible to do. So suppose we separated memory into, I don't know, 16 different kinds, and privileged instructions are only allowed to execute out of one memory, or stacks are only allowed to grow in one kind of memory. Would that allow us to set up some divisions that would give us a greater trust in the uh, resulting architecture. I don't have an answer for that. Uh, I suspect that there are things that we can do, but who's doing that investigation? Again, it goes back to what I was talking about following the herd. Everyone's paying us to develop on Intel or PowerPC uh, processors. Generally, there may be a, the cell processor, perhaps. Uh, but we aren't really exploring radically new designs that might work better for trusted systems. We should be. As another example, the Ferranti Atlas. 
um, I believe it was Manchester, University of Manchester. In 1961, they came up with the idea, sorry, they came up with the idea of paging because memory was expensive. Anybody, anybody know uh, how much memory the Ferranti Atlas had? Right. 256 words. And if your program exceeded 256 words, you had to page it out to drum. Absolutely amazing that they were able to get something to work like that. Uh, and that's a picture of the, of the atlas there, by the way. But memory was very expensive. And with only 256K, uh, you didn't have a lot to work with. So paging was a necessity. How many of you have systems that page on a regular basis? Uh, one, one or two of you, perhaps. Uh, but the majority of systems, when you look at the average usage pattern, don't do that. I, I did some experimentation with a couple, a couple systems that we had in the lab and laptops. Uh, memory was cheap. We just put in another, we put in another bank of memory, and we never saw it page. We could actually use RAM disks, and we still didn't use up all the memory. There was no reason for paging. But all the circuitry that's devoted to paging, all of the operating system code that's devoted to paging, why? Why? Because early machines were expensive. We had to multitask them. We had to page the memory. It's not true anymore. So could we do something differently? Would we be able to take advantage of that fact and somehow build systems differently or at least eliminate all of that, actual function, that extra functionality that if we are going to go about having a trusted system, we have to verify, test, maybe even prove? We can eliminate it. It's not needed. Maybe not in every system. Certainly some of the very large, uh, large um, uh, numerical processing kinds of systems, the supercomputing, they tend to use this or very large data sets. That isn't every computer. That's only some of them. I'll tell you a story here about programming. Once upon a time, we all tended to uh, exclude array. Uh, we, we checked array bounds. Uh, we did argument matching. We did precondition and postcondition checking, or we knew how to do that. And you may not be familiar with that. That may not be something that you normally do, but it was in a lot of languages. It was either built in at the compiler so that extra code went in, or we did it manually. COBOL was actually a safer language as much as some of us pick on it, although again, I don't know how many, how many of you have ever actually even programmed in COBOL. Uh, four or five, minority. It's not a common language anymore. And if I were to bring up some others that had features like that, like Jovial uh, or, or some of those, uh, we'd be getting a little more obscure. Uh, but most of those languages of the, of the era in the uh, 60s and 70s had built-in bounds checking, had the ability to do argument checking and, and uh, pre- and post-condition matching. The reason, or one reason, and I can't say it's the only reason, um, Back in the days when Unix was being developed, one of the most popular machines for it to find its way into university environments was on the uh, PDP-11. And uh, as I recall, the PDP-1135 uh, had a breakthrough in memory of sorts. It allowed you to have 64K of memory, 32K for user programs and 32K for the operating system. That was a lot. Okay, 32 kilobytes. The entire Unix operating system fit in 32 kilobytes of memory. It's rather spectacular. So when uh, Dennis uh, Ritchie was working on the C compiler, it turned out that he had to break the compiler up into separate passes. There was a pass that went through for the preprocessor, then a pass for the parser, and then a pass for the code generation. Well, the parser just barely fit in 32K of memory. He couldn't put in the argument type checking 
or array bounds checking that he knew about. He built it into a program called Lint. If you go back, if you were used Unix, uh, older Unix, or if you look in the history, Lint was a separate program that had a parser that looked for those things. It looked for potential mismatches. And to the credit of AT&T, at the time they were building the phone system, they required the use of Lint on all programs. So they were able to find those problems. But it wasn't in the compiler. And so the, ver the version that got distributed to all the universities around the world didn't have that built in. And we got in the habit of not bothering to check for those those kinds of problems or not having them in the language. And as everything in this field, we started to push the limits and we started to build things that took a long time to run or took a lot of memory and uh, we didn't want the extra code. And so we developed this mindset that it was too expensive. But expensive is, is relative when we're talking about reliability and security. The fact that a system may fail or be overwritten or taken control of is probably much more serious to us than an extra one second of run one one second of runtime. But we still have this myth that doing those checks is too slow or takes up too much memory. What could we do differently? What languages would be better languages? What can we build into hardware that will enable these checks to work better for us? Again, transistors are basically free. Memory is basically free. And in some contexts, having a trusted system is much, much more important than shaving a second or two off runtime. In embedded systems, real-time systems, yeah, that's an issue. The people from Green Hills, uh, their product, goes in a lot of embedded systems. So execution time can make a difference. But not for most others. And if you go through and look at the uh, CVE, the uh, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures list, the majority of vulnerabilities come about from things that could have been checked by a simple programming language change. So what language do you program in and why? Question to ask. All right, we'll try and get it to advance here. I think, there we go. So uh, the first stack machine was the RAND IPL machine in 1958. Before that, we didn't have stacks in computer systems. ALGOL 60, we didn't have recursion in programming languages. Uh, prior to ALGOL 60, the way that you handle subroutine calls was a jump and store. So you jumped to the beginning of the code and at that beginning of code in a defined location, you stored your return address and register values. So if you call the routine again before returning, you overwrote the previous call and the most you could ever do was return to the most recent invocation. Algol 60 created the idea of a procedure call stack. Why are we still building effectively with only single stacks? We can have lots of registers. We've got lots of memory. Are there things we could do differently if we had multiple stacks? Back in the days of the HP 9000, I believe it was, it had an array of stacks, a display of stacks, and gave a lot of freedom in the design of some of the languages. What could we do for security if we had different stacks? The problems we have now with buffer overflows could be very different if the return calls were on one stack and all the buffers were on another. Or separate them by function, by thread, by process. Lots of other possibilities. Why do we only design one way? Shared libraries. Are shared libraries still necessary? And if so, why? Can we do it another way? Shared libraries are the pathway for a number of rootkits and botnets to establish themselves. But memory is cheap and security is important. So can we do it a different way? I think we can. How? I don't know. I'm posing it as an open question that we need to look at. We need to consider that. Why do we continue to use shared libraries? Another example, B 
the all-in-one operating system. I pick on this one a lot. Um, when you think about why do we have operating systems? Well, there's largely two reasons. One is it provides a cleaned up shared interface to devices. So we don't have to rewrite the device drivers over and over again. And second of all, it provides controlled sharing of the resources among different processes and users. Both good reasons. But question the assumptions. Question the beginning. What if we didn't need to share? Or what if we didn't need all of those devices? Could we dispense with the operating system altogether? And uh, I'd say it's not so far-fetched. The figure that I have seen, and I have no way of verifying this, but I don't have a way of disputing it either, is that 98% of all computer processors are running embedded systems that we don't see. That the largest uh, by number uh, processor that's out there deployed is the PowerPC architecture in real time and SCADA controllers. We don't see that. That's the biggest market. So it is possible. All these systems run them. Everything from microwave ovens to your iPod to your phone, uh, embedded systems in flight control and so on. So if processors are cheap and memory is cheap, why don't we have dedicated processors for tasks instead of sharing the tasks on the processors? This is actually a project that for several years now I've been trying to get funding for, um, getting interesting responses from reviewers such as, uh, interesting idea but won't work with Windows. Very frustrating. Uh, if you've got 64 processors on a chip, and you will in a year or two, one approach is that you have a scheduler that takes all the available tasks and apportions them out to the next processor. That's the traditional model. Well, how about turn it around a little bit and say, OK, processor number one from now on will do all of the disk I.O. And processor two will do all of the network routing. And processor three will do all of the email. There's no sharing. The, the communication in memory is made simpler. The protection is made simpler. Why don't we build that way? Gives us a lot of other advantages. If a processor doesn't need a disk or a file system, you don't build one. All the state's temporary. It can have onboard memory. No need for address translation at the network level because it knows what it's connected to. No need for all those extra device drivers to be written and included and serve up as potential pathways for misuse and so on. Think differently about operating systems and you come up with different architectures that people aren't currently trying. Instead, all you read about are people trying to do these large multiprocessor systems on cores that use pools of processors, and they're finding limits to the parallelization. Can that be overcome? Maybe so. It's an interesting research problem, but it's not the only approach. There are a lot of other, um, that's redesign, not red sign, but um, a lot of other uh, uh, possibilities for redesign. File systems. The way they're currently designed have huge problems with latency, throughput, backup, and more. It is, we're back to the point now where it is cheaper to use UPS or DHL to send your disk drive to a collaborator if it's full of material than it is to try to copy it over the network. And RAID is a better solution than trying to do backups because it takes so long to get everything off the disk. This is proving a challenge in a number of areas, database, forensics, and so on. But it's because of the file system design. Language design, I've already alluded to. Databases, there are a number of possibilities there. Um, audit and forensics, uh, big problems, especially if we're going to protect privacy. That needs to be built in from the beginning. So many, many more examples. And I'm not going to go through any more of them now because I hopefully have given you just a little bit of the thinking here about how to go back and re-examine some of these issues and maybe you'll find a better approach that hasn't been tried or hasn't been tried in 50 years. And that doesn't mean that it won't work now. Uh, in fact, there's this approach, I, I've had this happen with students, using big O notation. Is this something everybody feels comfortable with? 
Well, what that really means is that there are constants such that the equation at the bottom is true. It doesn't mean that all algorithms follow that ordering. Because if you have the right coefficients, you can have an order n algorithm take longer than an order n squared, take longer than an order e to the n. If you have the wrong coefficients on an algorithm in a certain environment, what seems obvious is no longer true. This means something for design. There are many algorithms, there are many things in the literature that if you go back and somebody says, well, it increases order n squared and therefore we can't use it. That was in an older single processor environment without much memory and nobody really defined what the constants were out in front. Could it be different now? Science is going back and saying what is possible. Instead of deferring to the engineering to say it couldn't have been done with the, with the computers then and the knowledge then, let's go back and ask really what is possible. I want to encourage you to just think outside the box that we've sort of been put into by uh, Windows and Linux and Intel and similar and IP version 4 and Ethernet and the other things that we take for granted that everybody says we build to. There are indeed engaging important problems in solving security or usability issues with those architectures. But that isn't the same as exploring new territory, finding new solutions. Some questions are just the wrong questions to answer, like how do I get multi-level security on my Windows box? It really isn't something you should spend your time trying to answer. And most importantly in science, and something we've gotten away from, uh, don't be afraid to fail. If you don't fail occasionally, you're not trying enough. You're not risking enough. You're being too safe. Now, in our field, unfortunately, we've gotten to the point where we don't publish failures. And that's unfortunate because it's difficult to learn from somebody else's failures if they don't publish them. Uh, other fields of science do uh, uh, try to recreate experiments or do things and publish that it didn't work and why. We don't do enough of that. And again, uh, what we do is we publish the successes in engineering. It's almost phenomenology rather than science. Because we say, well, if we throw this thing together and this thing together and maybe the phase of the moon and it works and we get throughput. That's not really science. So here's some other questions that aren't the same as out of the box but are related. How do we measure security? I really don't know that we can make a lot of progress until we can agree on something that we can use as, as a metric or a series of metrics because there's no way to tell if we made an improvement and by how much. What is availability? I really don't know. The term by itself we could kind of agree to, but if we begin to drill down, we won't get there. Privacy is worse. I won't even get there. Um, how do we specify security properties that we want? And what does identity mean after all? Uh, these are all issues that I think are, we need to resolve. Uh, they're examples of things. They're basic terminological issues, basic metric issues, and we still haven't solved them. Um, so so the, the theme of all this talk is for us to really trust our artifacts, we need to go back and lay down an appropriate science foundation uh, instead, of, instead of continuing to try to engineer solutions to broken attempts based on old technologies. That really is the state of the field. When I've, when I've uh, talked about this in front of other audiences, they're saying, well, what are we going to do about funding for research? The, the economy is terrible. Um, governments aren't good, and if they're only going to fund us for working on the existing systems, what do we do? Um, I don't have good specific advice. I have general advice, uh, which is find unexpected opportunities. And, uh, in the back there, the, the uh, caption says, let's see, shovel, charcoal, lighter fluid, matches. Well, this is all useless without any meat, isn't it, Earl? 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 And this is the difference between pessimism and optimism. 
the fact that we don't have a lot of resources right now may be a good thing because it means that trying something different could have a very far-reaching effect. When there's lots of funding and everybody is trying up their pet theory, sometimes the good ideas get washed out or people try to take them to market instead of really exploring them. This may be a good time to actually pursue the idea of doing novel things. I would encourage you to do this. Stray from the comfortable path. Think through the hard problems. Because when it comes down to it, we're the people that society is depending on. We're the ones they trust. And thank you very much for your attention.